Father, we thank you that you've given us your word. May the power of your word energize us. May the, the love of your word transform us. May the truth of your word enlighten us, God. And may we, as the psalm writer wrote, may we not be satisfied ourselves until we awake in, in your likeness, God. We want to be more and more like you. Help us, God. Begin this good work. As your word says, if you begun a good work, we'll complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Now, let me give you a background on the book of 2 Timothy. That way you guys understand. Um, before I even do that, if I told you I had a week to live and I was up here and I said, hey guys, this is my last, this is my last Sunday. Um, I'm not going to be here anymore. I have an appointment with heaven. I pour everything out that I had. The last bit of everything I wanted to say, I just, man, it would be it. Uh, it's been well said by many great preachers. You preach every message like it's your last. You don't hold nothing back. And I try to do that. This book that we're about to start, that's what Paul did. Paul was in a, a Roman prison. He was charged with a crime punishable by death. And he knew at any point in time he could hear the footsteps in the hall. Click, click, click. And that would be it for him. He knew his time was ending. This book was written at the end of A.D. 66. Some say Paul was close to 70 years old. And you would hear as we go through this book the fatigue in his spirit. Paul his whole life was running the race with endurance and going forward. And something about this pause, this I've done it. I've fought the good fight, you'll hear him say. You'll hear him say many things that you never heard him say. He talks about being lonely and about being cold and how everybody has abandoned him. This is a very, very emotional book, more personal than any book that you've ever read from Paul. Um, but the one thing that we get out of this book is the ability to hear the heart of a great man, a man who is used by God mightily, a man who knew more about grace than anybody. Imagine, I mean, I know that some of you guys, you come from a, 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 a ruckus background. Some of you guys were smokers and drinkers and partiers. And Paul wasn't that. Paul really believed he was serving God by killing Christians. The guy that wrote this book believed he was doing God a service by killing those who believed in Jesus. An amazing transformation occurs in his life. And he's every day blown away. God, why would you choose me? Why would you use me? And after 40 plus years of ministry, after starting churches, the original missionary comes to the end of his life. He's in a, some say, looking at the prisons that they had in Rome, it was a big hole in the ground with a, a grate, a metal grate thrown on top of it. And he'd sit up there and as the sun would break in the morning and look up and he wrote his letter to his son, his son in the faith, Timothy. He starts out where everything for us starts out. Verse one, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. He starts out by saying, listen, this isn't my will. And this is so important, guys. Please understand, we're going to look at two important aspects of faith over the next few months. Sacrifice and suffering. In the American church, there is no suffering. Nothing. Zero. Not as compared to what's really going on. Paul is in a Roman prison for his faith in Christ. Anybody here been arrested for their faith? I mean, honestly, I've been arrested a bunch of times. Not once for faith. Stupidity? Oh, in abundance. Greed? In abundance. Violence? Way too much. Faith? Paul says, what do you think I'm doing in this prison? 
It's my choice. It was God's will for me to be here. I am the Apostle Paul. By God's will. No other reason. In the American church, you're not sure if I'm up here by my will or God's will. I haven't sacrificed anything nor <laughs> suffered anything to be here. Some days I question to myself. Especially my wife reminds me. Did I do this myself? Am I just an encouraging speaker? Did I build this church up by my pushiness? By my excitement? Or is this you, God? How do I know for sure it's God? It certainly ain't from suffering and sacrifice. You know what I'm saying? So every day I gotta check it. I check it. God, if it ain't you, take it away. Don't make this thing too big. I never want this thing to depend upon me. Praise God, I can go away for a couple weeks and I got brothers like Gibson and Lee who could bring the word seamless. Seamless. The word went forward. People's lives were changed. People grew in the Lord. Does that pastor ever preach at his own church? I might never again. I might not be here next week. If you're coming here for me, you came here for the wrong reason anyway. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> to Timothy, a beloved son. Timothy was his son in the faith. Timothy was one of those kids who's... Timothy's mother and grandmother came to one of the churches that he planted. I think it was the one in Ephesus. And they got saved. And then he got saved as a young man. And when sometimes young men get saved, you see something in them. You see this something with this one. You see something. You see something. I can be so bold as to say my young brother back there, Andre, and his brother Deshaun, you see something about them. You just see it. Something. There's a spark. Could be. Could be. The world has got a lot of pull. Enticement of the sensuality of this world. But, but there's more to them. There's, it's not, they're not just coming here because their parents are here. You could tell. God's done something in them. And this is what he's saying. To Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day. Now again, let me remind you, he's in a prison. He's in a prison cell. He's in a hole in the ground. And he's writing this letter and he's remembering his young son Timothy Maybe he's thinking about the passing of the torch or something, and he's, so I, I remember you. So I serve God with a pure conscience. And let me tell you why he's saying he's serving God with a pure conscience. Guys, let me tell you why. Because he's in jail. And it's normal for us as people to think somebody that's in jail or in prison, they've done something wrong and they deserve it. I know when I was in prison, the last time I went to prison in 1995, I got arrested in 94, went to prison in 95, through all 96 and 7, I was away. I got saved during that time and I thought, God, if you loved me, you'd get me out of this. And now looking back, and God was saying, well, if you loved me, you probably wouldn't have screwed up so bad. <laughs> yeah, that's more like it. But nobody was there and that you said, hey, you know, what did you do? I didn't do nothing. You know, I, I'm innocent. It's like everybody believed they were innocent. The government's against them because of what color they were. The government's against them because of what neighborhood they came from. The government's against them because of what language they spoke. The government's against them all. But yet everybody looked at each other going, oh, you're one of those too, I see. No, l let me explain to you what Paul said. He's serving God with a pure conscience. That he's in prison and he don't deserve to be there. And as soon as they outlaw Christianity in our country and don't think it ain't coming down the pike. 
How many of you guys are still going to be here? Very famous story. I want to say it happened in... Man, I can't remember where. It's from that book, um, Voice of the Martyrs, uh, Jesus Freak. Jesus Freaks. They walk in with guns. I think it was Russia. And who here is Christians? And there's about a dozen people that get up. No, 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 we're here. We're infiltrating. We're spies. And they all leave. Who the rest of you are Christians? The pastor and a few of them left in the home church say, we are. And they throw their guns on and they say, praise God, we need to worship with people who are serious. Amen. <laughs> we laugh, but it is a true story. That's a true story. That's something that really happened. With a pure conscience, he served God. And he says he never stops praying for him night and day. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> When I was in my bed, sick, I had a flu or a fever, whatever I had, I wasn't praying for you all. <laughs> I was praying for me. God, why did you let this happen to me? God, that's two weeks I ain't been in my church. People aren't going to love me anymore. <laughs> Heal me. I go anoint myself with oil. Heal me. <laughs> Like a little crybaby. <laughs> Paul says, I'm praying for you. You're in a prison, Paul. You deserve to be taken care of now. Somebody should be there taking care of you. Paul wasn't about that. I love this guy. How do you not love this guy? With a pure conscience, serving God, praying for his son in the faith. Now, I mean, just... Just for flat out honesty. No, I did. I prayed for you guys almost every day. But I just wanted to make an illustration there. <laughs> but I did pray for you all. And I, and I thank God every day. And I didn't complain about my, my situation. I said, God, you know what? Being sick sucks. But if whatever it is, let me see something out of this thing. That I really did do that. But I just want to make an illustration there. <laughs> Verse 4. Greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. First of all, he says he, he remembers, he remembers crying. He remembers when he sent, maybe it was when he sent them out to start the church. Now Timothy has grown into a young man, some would say in his early 20s, and he sent him to be the pastor at the church in Ephesus, or one of the churches. He, he sent him to be the pastor there. I guess when they parted ways, there was tears. He said, I remember when we sent you out, when we laid hands on you, and your, and your genuine faith caused you to cry. So I remember. <laughs> that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice and I'm persuaded is in you also he says I remember your mom and your grandma how they brought you to church and just sanctified imagination saying and you, and you went out to youth group and pastor, the youth pastor said, oh, this kid's different, man. There's something about this kid, I'm telling you. He just remembering about him. He's in a prison. And let me tell you, if you've never been in a, in a pit, a prison, whether it's a pit of infirmity or financial woe or whatever it is, you remember your life. You, you start to think about the things. It's amazing what your brain has recorded that you don't remember that later on you're like, wow, why did I remember that? You know what I mean? The brain is such an amazing computer that, that holds things, gigabytes and terabytes worth of information that you don't even know is there. But every once in a while, you just, you just, wow. You ever, and anybody ever talking about? Amen. Amen. I, I was opening a, a piece of fruit the other day and it gave off a smell and it reminded me of something that happened when I was like nine years old. And I was like, what an amazing Thing that's going on in my brain right now. This, this, this brain of mine. You, you know what I'm talking about? When you're in a pit, he's remem remembering, I remember your grandmother and your mother and the genuine faith and the laying out of your hands and the tears. And Hey, listen, and when they speak ill of me, don't worry. Don't have to defend me. I, I serve God with a pure conscience. I know they'll speak ill of me. 
because everybody that suffers, of course, God must be mad at them. God must hate them because otherwise God wouldn't have let that happen, right? Suffering is not of the Lord, is it? Just don't buy into all of that word of faith movement garbage. I'm here, a prisoner of the Lord, is what he's saying. He'll say those things exactly, too later in this book, and he says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now we get to the body of what we're going to discuss today. He says, to stir up the gift. You see that word for gift? That's the word charisma. So there was actually a charismatic gift given. There was something when they laid hands on him that's one of the elders of the church, one of what's called the presbytery, one of the pastors of the church maybe said, I sense the Lord give this young man the gift of, was it evangelism? Was it speaking in tongues? Was it boldness? There's so many gifts of the Holy Spirit. And ladies, when you're going through that book, Living Water, you're going to see all of the gifts lift, listed in, in Scripture. It's phenomenal to find your gift, to ask God. Some of you guys, maybe you're new to Scripture. Maybe you're new to church. Maybe you're not so new. Maybe you're in that three to five year range. You go, yeah, I heard about the gifts of the Spirit. Does everybody get a gift of the Spirit? Everybody. Oh, but I've been in the church for years and I didn't have no gift. Did you ever get hands laid on by the elders? Did you ask God for the gifts? God says you have not because you ask not. Everybody. Oh, yeah, but like that gift of speaking in tongues, you guys don't do that here. Yes, we do. Well, I never heard you. You're not gonna. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to God. Well, what is the gift of speaking in tongues? It's another service, but you could find it in that book, Living Water. There's the gift of speaking in tongues. There's interpretation of tongues. There's a gift called discerning of spirits, where somebody could walk in and they may be demon-possessed, oppressed, and all of a sudden you go, whoa, what was that? And it's sometimes God just, he, he just blows this little breeze on you, and you're like, what was that? That's the beginning of your gift. And you have to stir it up. You have to work it out. You have to exercise it like faith, like, like, like a faith muscle. Here, apparently, a timid young man Paul uh, was speaking to. Timothy was... No, I don't... I don't can, Faye, can I... Where's Faye? Good. <laughs> Faye, my mother-in-law, is from a... Uh, Southern Baptist background. And you know Southern Baptists don't speak in tongues. But I knew she had the gift of speaking in tongues. And when I prayed for that woman, and she come to tell me, I was praying, and it just happened. <laughs> she tells a story about how she first spoke in tongues. I said, a Southern Baptist woman like you, proper and all? Speaking in tongues? Woo, lordy, lordy. <laughs> God will stir it. People will pray for it and bring it out and use it. But every single one of you has a gift of the Holy Spirit that God wants to use to edify the body. Some of you have the gift of encouragement. Some of you have the gift of administrations. Some of you have the gift of helps, the gift of love. So many gifts, and all of you got them, and God needs to use them, and he wants to use them in the body. And you know what the crazy thing is? It's crazy. If you have a gift, and you're not using it in the church to glorify, God will bring somebody else with that same gift, and then they will have your office in the church because you refuse to, excuse me, to use that gift. Incredible. Incredible. I've seen God do some crazy things. Leah, one of the most timid, shy people you'll ever meet, she leads worship. Oh! Then what we're going to talk about today, verse 7, and, and this verse is a, a tattoo verse. If, if you want to get a tattoo, this is a great verse to get. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Now, I love the way he used the word us in there, kind of illustrating that this verse is not just for Timothy. It's not just for Paul. It's for 
us. Now I want you to, I'm going to pull it apart and then I'm going to kind of come down on you a little bit. Not come down on you as in a negative way, but I'm going to pull you out. Watch. He has not given us a spirit of fear. You see that word for fear? That is not the word phobia in the Greek. I don't know how to pronounce the word. I saw it, but it is a choice that you make more often interpreted as cowardice. It's a word meaning shrinking back on one's own accord. He has not given you the spirit of God for cowardice. He's not given you the spirit of fear. He's not given you the spirit of, I can't do it. He's not given you the spirit of timidity. He's not given you the spirit of, ready, prideful fear. Stay with me but of power, love, sound mind. Those three words encompass the majority of what Christians need. That word for power is the word dunamis, where we get our English word for dynamite. It is when the Spirit falls upon you and boom, you become new in Christ. And what comes to pass in your life is the scripture that says, Behold, I make all things new. When people look at your life and they go, What the heck happened to you? <laughs> You're the same guy I knew from school, but very different. You, did you adopt two little kids? Oh my goodness, you're a good person. That's what I usually, me and my wife get that all the time. When you've done something to alter your life. When you've done something in your life where your life is never the same anymore. Like me and my wife, like, like some of you guys that do foster care, you guys that are adoptive parents. People look at your life and it's the craziest thing. Guys, listen to me. It's the craziest thing. People sense that they're in the presence of holiness all of a sudden, like, like we're holy. You know what I'm talking, you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You adopted two kids, and they're not yours, and they're a different color. You're good people. No, no, we're real pieces of garbage. We just really feel this need to do more than we've ever done. The Bible says that too much is given, much is, and they don't even want to hear it. They're like, Oh my, I go to restaurants where I know people, they give you free meals and everything's like, all right, you know, free food. Free. <laughs> I'll see you next week, you know what I mean? I'm going to bring my kids with me. <laughs> they do. That's that dunamis power. That's that, wow, there's something different when he's not giving you that spirit of fear, but of power, of love. You see that word for love there? That's that word agapeo, which means unconditional. He's not giving you a spirit of fear. He's giving you this dynamite power to love those who are unlovable. To love those who are unlovable. Everybody has a type of person that is what's called their people group. Now I got in a lot of trouble last time for saying this, so of course I'm going to say it again. A few people left the church. I don't know why still. But I, my people group is ghetto rats. I like ghetto rats. Whatever color, whatever, if they have their drawers down below their butt cheeks, if they walk like this, if they got tattoos everywhere, that's my people. I love those kids. I love hanging with them. I love talking. I love hearing their story. I love it. I have zero intimidation from them. I, get, I love it. The harder, the nastier looking, the me those are my people group. I love it. And I love them. I love inviting them to church. Like, no, I ain't the church going type. Come on, man. Be the church going type. Give it a go. Praying for him. Watching him pray over a, a gang member in front of his boys, and they're like, wow. What's your people group? Who has God given you an unconditional love? For some of you all, it's little kids. Some of you guys just love little kids. You get these little three and four year olds that have been in the foster care system their whole lives and oh my goodness, they are the brattiest, nastiest, most entitled little turd you ever met in your life. And you just love them to death and you pick them up and you hug them and you pinch them and I just want to get them away from me. Get them away. 
That's your people group. Some guys, some of you all, say, old folks over at the convalescent home, you just can't wait to get there next week. And some people, oh no, because some of them, they, they drool and they say crazy things and they, and you guys, no. Nah. But some of, them, some of you all love it. Oh no, I love it. You get right down and wipe their face off and you even change their diaper. And yeah, that's right. Some of them wear diapers. But that's your people group. See, God's not given you the spirit of fear, but he's given you the power to love unconditional with a sound mind. The word for sound mind there, it means you've not been talked into it. It's the reality of who you are now. And it's forever. Leaving here, I want to turn and, and stay in the whole theme of, of um, power and fear. Please turn to Matthew chapter 10. You see, the American church might have to, at some point in time, experience sacrifice. Some of you guys might have had to experience one or another type of sacrifice, but never suffering. We don't know any clue what it is to suffer in our, in our church. You might have to give up something, but the cost of discipleship, according to the Lord Jesus Christ, is your fear. What are, you, what are you talking about, Ryan? Now you've lost me completely. I'm glad. I want you to stay with me as I tell you what spirit God has not given us. Fear. Fear. Remember what we're dealing with. Remember who we're dealing with. Timothy wrote this book. I'm sorry. Paul wrote this book to Timothy, who is a timid man. He says, you've you got to stop being afraid, man. He says, we, we gave you this, the, we, we laid our hands on you, we sent you out because we believe in you. You have genuine faith, we saw it. You have a genuine gift, we felt it. We sensed it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Stop being afraid. Now some of you guys right now are like, yeah, I gotta stop being afraid, but let me tell you something. Some of you guys are so afraid you're so afraid. You're so afraid God's going to change your life. You're so afraid you're not going to be who you were. You're so afraid your husband's not going to see you as he used to. You're so afraid and you get to work. You're afraid. You're afraid. Look at all the areas the Lord Jesus was telling his apostles, his disciples. Verse 1 of chapter 10. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them dunamis over unclean spirits, to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Listen, one of the things that people are afraid of, for me, I don't know if you're like me, but horror movies, when I was growing up, used to affect me really badly. Like, I saw The Exorcist when I was 12 years old, and it scared me. Let me tell you what. It scared me, not a little. It scared me like as in I was never the same after that. I always thought demons were going to get me. I would take a bath and, and I'd, I'd swear I was seeing a demon's head come out of the water. I didn't want to swim because I thought there was devils underneath the pool water that were going to come and grab me. But here's what I didn't know. God was beginning a work in me called discerning of spirits. And the devil was trying to... <coughs> distract me. He was trying to scare me. And so I stayed far. Anything spooky. I don't go watch. I don't watch scary movies. They freak me out. But yet God was saying, Ryan, even at that young age, you had the discernment of spirits. You could sense the spiritual realm. And I fully embraced it about 12 years ago and started going into ministry where there were devils and demons and the possessed. And, and, and listen, I'm not trying to freak anybody out. If you're one of those people, God's calling you. You think devils and demons and, and that stuff ain't real? Okay, well, let's talk about that a different service. If you're one of those people that have been curious and that always, you're always spooked out by that stuff and you always, you smell stuff, it's so weird. Don't be afraid. Because the only thing we know about devils and demons is what the Bible says. And he who made them, and he who formed them, and he is what they call the Lord of hosts. 
He tells them, go, and they go. He tells them, come, and they come. He told the legion, go. A legion, and they departed. He told the devil himself, when talking about Job, all right, you can touch his body, you can touch his finances, you can mess with his family, but don't you dare touch his body. And guess what? The devil had to listen because that's God Almighty. And if you have the living God living inside you, you have no fear. You don't have to be afraid of anything. But the sound of Jesus' name, the Bible says, causes them to tremble, if you believe. But they want you to be afraid, and they're going to spook you. And you're going you're gonna to get your change, and it's going to be $6.66. And you're going to go, oh, the devil's after me. You didn't know the devil was after you? Was that a surprise to you? <laughs> yeah, but look at the change. Yeah, but you understand, that's the only thing he can do is parlor tricks. That's what he can do. He can do card tricks. Pick a card, any card. Six, six, six! <laughs> but that's it. What's he going to do? I don't know, but I'm going to get into a car accident. No, you're not. Oh, my wife's going to... No, she's not. That's it. That's it. That's it. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Verse, skip down to 5, because then he names all his apostles. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go to the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter the house of the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Let me tell you what he told them first. I want you to go to your family. Some of you guys are afraid. Oh, you're afraid to tell mom and dad what God's done in your heart. You're afraid to tell your cousins. You're afraid to tell your brother that you're one of them. That prideful fear that you have, what will they think about you? What, what's going to happen at the family dinners when they find out you go to church? Fear. Oh, don't mess with my life now. Oh, I ain't even begun. I ain't even begun. Stop being afraid. Listen to me. When you lay your whole life on the altar, God turns the fire up and he burns it. And it's all gone. And it's wonderful afterward. It's the greatest thing that could have ever happened to your life. Don't be afraid of your family. Don't be afraid. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, Raise the dead, cast out the demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two, two tunics, nor sandals, nor staff. Listen to me. Listen. Some of you guys are afraid of your finances. What if I have to give 10%? What if I have to tell the people at work I'm a Christian? Oh, my boss, he hates Christians. The guy that runs my shop, the guy that does this, oh, I'm not, I can't tell them I'm a Christian. I can't tell them. Don't be afraid. God's on your side. The hand of God holds the king's heart. And like the river of water, he turns it anywhere he wishes. If you lose your job because of your faith in Jesus Christ, and that's not the job that the Lord Jesus had for you, and I know that's hard. Oh, I know it. Don't think I don't. Don't think I don't. You are not, you're not with a guy that was born with a silver spoon. I moved down to Florida with zero. I got here on fumes and I had nothing. No parents to call to get money from. Zero. I worked for five bucks an hour cleaning up a guy's warehouse complex and I slept in my car. I'm with you. I'm one of us. And you're afraid. God's saying, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Be a bold witness. I can provide everything that you need. Whatever city or town you enter, verse 11, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. <laughs> You're afraid of fellowship. You've heard all your life and you've seen all your life. Christians are a bunch of flipping weirdos, man. They're weirdos. I don't want to hang out with these people. I don't like these people. 
Yeah, I'm, I, I'm with you on that one. Never mind. <laughs> no. You're going to have to tell your friends, um, man, I'm going to, going to church on Wednesday night. Dude, we're all going out. You're afraid, man. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God's got a great plan for your life, man, and it's a whole lot better than the world's plan. He's got a great plan for your life, and he's in control of the world, and all of its kingdoms are under his authority. You're afraid, and I know you're afraid, because I was afraid. And when you go into the household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the last, for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me explain to you what he's saying there. Your Christianity is going to end some friendships, guys. Some good friendships. I've lost a lot of good friends over my faith in Christ. My belief in Jesus. And I didn't want to lose him. I, man, I, little guy I grew up with. I was 15, he was 11. He came to live with me. We stayed together for years, man. We were together for over 10 years, like brothers, man. He was my brother. We slept in bed back to back, hands on the triggers, ready, because that's the lifestyle we lived. And he couldn't handle my faith in Christ. Where after I moved down to Florida and I had him come down here and he came to church, he's like, dude, I don't know, I don't even know you anymore. Bro, this is life, man. That's not my life, that's your life. But I, you know, we could still be friends. No. We couldn't. And I was afraid. No friends in, in the body of Christ. The men, Christian men are bunch of sissies. At least I thought so. I really did. Guys at all I knew. Oh, you said a bad word. Oh, ooh. You, oh, I saw you look at that girl. Oh, I said. Just talked with all the same language. Like, yeah. I don't want to be one of you guys. If being one of you guys means, if following Christ means being one of you guys, I don't want to be one of you guys. I was afraid. And the Lord Jesus said, don't be afraid. I'm like you. No, man, I see the people that follow you, and, 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 and you're like them. Who told you I was like them? Well, they did. I'm like you. <coughs> I'm strong, and I'm tough, and I'm hard, and I understand what you're going through, and I don't pretend for nobody, ever afraid and you're afraid and I know you're afraid I know you're afraid to tell your sister I know you're afraid to tell your friends I know you are it's already cost you and you don't want it to cost you anymore but he's not giving you a spirit of fear he's giving you a spirit of power dynamite power behold I send you out verse 16 as sheep in the midst of wolves Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I love that. I love that verse. He says, don't be afraid. Be smart. Because when I first came to the Lord, I thought, oh, that's it. I don't need any of my street smarts. Now i got to be this, this, I'll just be a moron with a big smile. He says, what? Hear the Lord Jesus telling his apostles, you're in ministry? Let me tell you something. Let me tell you exactly what he's saying here. Keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. Amen. He says, don't let people know what you're thinking. You don't have to share the treasures of your heart with everybody just because you're a Christian. Be wise as a serpent, but gentle as a dove. Amen. Wow. You mean I could still use my brains as a Christian? Yes. That's the whole point. As a Christian, you're supposed to have the mind of Christ. You're supposed to be smarter than everybody else because the Lord God lives inside you. Yeah, maybe you can't smack around a couple of guys like you wanted to. Maybe you can't post on Facebook how that girl hurt you and she deserves a beating or something like that, ladies. But 
He says, be wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove. Keep people close, but don't be stupid. I see, I always thought I had to be stupid to be a Christian. Well, you were wrong. You mean I was afraid of the wrong thing? You've always been afraid of the wrong thing. Are you with me? Is anybody with me? Amen. Are you? <clears throat> Beware of men because they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, don't worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. Praise God! Praise God! I don't have to be a schnook. I could be smart and wise and thinking and a little bit cautious. A little worried about the guy who, even though he has a church around the corner or goes to another church, well, he's my brother. Maybe not. Be careful. Just be careful. Now brother will deliver up brother to death and father his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. There's a great promise. Now you got something to be afraid of. No, you don't. Watch what he says. But he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Listen, this is, this is serious. In case you thought that once you came to Christ, everything would be swell. And now God's in complete control. No more have to anything to worry about. God's going to protect you. None of your bones will get broken. All your family's going to love you, your friends. No. You sign up for this army. Remember, you've joined the army. And rule number one in the army is people get killed. And you know what rule number two is? Generals can't change rule number one. Now, our general can, but he's not going to. And he says, yeah, things are going to get tough. Things are going to get really tough for you. Especially you guys who are serious and not afraid. Especially you guys that are serious and not afraid, who are filled with that power. That power that makes you bold. That power that says... My brother hates my guts. Listen. My brother, my brother, my blood brother, read this verse. Turn the page. Look at verse 34. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. My father, my brother, read that verse and said, this is what you follow? This is it, huh? We're not blood anymore. We're not family anymore. Is that it? Sword, right? Not peace. This is the cult that you've joined? <laughs> what do you say? Anybody? What do you say to your brother? It's my brother. It's my brother. I said, yeah. That's it. It's the club I've joined. I'm not afraid. Because I know that God's plan for your life is as good as his plan for my life. And if you will let go of all of your anger and bitterness and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, 
you will be my brother in the spirit as well as my brother in the flesh. Wish I could tell you the story had a better ending than it did. My brother died about two and a half years ago of a drug overdose. And he was the last one. At one point there was four of us. I'm the only one left. Why God preserved my life, why God chose me out of all that, I don't know. I don't know. But it, every day it has me going, thank you. Every day, why did you choose me for this? And he says, don't be afraid. I've got this. Come with me. Let's do it. We'll do it together. Let's go. Come on. He doesn't go, oh, I'm sorry. Did you read your Bible today? <laughs> no, he grabs me by my shoulders and he shakes me and he goes, come on. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. They nailed me to a cross. My father watched. Stop this nonsense. Come on. Let's do it. We can do it. We can do it together. Okay. I'm with you. Now, he probably doesn't speak that same way to you ladies. <laughs> but that's how he talks to me. And that's how I respond. And that's how I reach. That's how he reaches in and pulls my heart out when it's cold and shivering and alone and tired and scared. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Last thing, guys, before we close. The fear of losing your life is the greatest fear you'll have because you won't know who to be. Some of y'all teachers here, salespeople, moms, some of my brothers that are fighters here, you won't know who to be because what you've always done is now not supposed to be what's always going to be and you're just like, wait a second, I don't know, I gotta figure out, I, I'm just not sure how this thing's gonna work. It's okay. God will draw you. God will pull you. God will lead you. God will help you. His son will fill you. But what you can't do is let fear stop you. For as a Christian in the army of Christ, you no longer are what you thought you were. You are not a plumber. You are a Christian who plums for Christ. And every appointment is potential to share God's love. You are no longer a reptile salesman. You are now a Christian who is waiting for the opportunity to share Christ with somebody who's going to buy a reptile. You are no longer a housewife. You are now a mom given a charge to raise your kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord, keeping your children safe from this world, safe from your family, keeping your husband strong. You are no longer a fighter. You are a Christian who God will give a platform in victory or in defeat to shine his light. And if it be defeat, then somehow you have to reconcile defeat finances, defeat physically, defeat spiritually. For not all make it. According to the book of Hebrews, the world's not worthy of some, and they die. But you have to reckon that defeat in Christ is better than victory in the world. And that's not easy. That is not easy. Close your book.
guys I know. <laughs> Ooh. Just think about the things, pray about them, and ask God to give you a spirit of power and sound mind. Power, love, sound mind. And if anything I said was something that stirred, scratched to bleed, if anything I said today made something in you bleed, don't be afraid of it anymore. Embrace it. Hold on to it with everything you have because defeat in Christ is greater than victory in this world. His plan for you will somehow, some way, bless you more than anything else. And even if that plan is a loss, even if that plan is poverty, even if that plan is whatever, you got to be able to tell God that. you got to be able to say, God, I'm in. I'm in, man. I am in. I am not afraid anymore. I don't care who knows. I am not care... They don't recognize me anymore because I don't talk like them. And I can't. I got to stop this. Why? Why? L listen. Why? Because you know you're not happy. That's why. You know it and I know it. I'm not trying to sell you some bill of goods that ain't the truth. You know you're still miserable. And you know why you're still miserable. Because you're not being true to the spirit of living God that's in you. Come on. Just fess up. You know it. If you were so happy, you wouldn't be here. I don't need this crap. Who needs this place? You're here because you're unhappy. You're here because you're afraid. You're here because God's calling you to let his spirit permeate every area of your life. And you've not yet. You've not. And he says, come on, let's do it together. You know I'm saying it's the truth. <coughs> Let's pray. Hmm. God, I stand before you guilty as charged. As if uh, a man apart from myself is preaching at me. And I receive by the power, the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit, the boldness and the love to be and to do and to say that which you would have me to in every area of my life. Every. God, I release every area. I just, I just visualize it. If you're with me in this, if, if, if this is your prayer too, just close your eyes for a second and visualize whatever area it is that you have to release to him. Just visualize it and, and give it just like, like a big mud ball. Just picture you're, you're, you're reaching into your own heart, your own spirit, and just taking out these big mud balls and just throwing them away, man. Just, just throw them away. God, take it from me. I want every area to be saturated and permeated. Decimate everything that is not of you. God, I am so tired of mediocrity. I'm so tired. So tired. I want more of you, God. More. Yes, Lord. We're here begging for your spirit to do this work. As we hear the, as we hear God, the, the desperation in Paul's voice, the, the hope for his young son Timothy, we know it's the same hope you have for us. May we live it. May we breathe it. May we pick up our cross and follow after you daily. May we lose our lives and find our lives. If you agree. In Christ, say amen. 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 God bless you all. Have a great weekend.